We are a body. We're called the body of Christ. And you are involved with each other. And you're also involved in the world as the body of Christ. The church is referred to in many terms. And I think you're familiar with many of those terms. Like, we're the bride of Christ. If we're the bride of Christ, he must be our... I think hard. We're the bride. He's the groom, right? He's the husband. We're the wife. He's the groom. We're the bride. And so the relationship is described in terms of husband and wife or bride and groom. Uh, We are his sheep and he is our shepherd. Relationship is established then and described in terms of a shepherd that takes care of the sheep, the sheep that are finding in the shepherd all that they need and protection and provision. We are a kingdom, and he is our king. Relationship is the kingdom of God and the king over his subjects, giving us law to live by, and again, protection and armies and all that's involved in kingdom and kingdom business. We find that describing our relationship with God. He is, Jesus, the high priest, and we are, we are either described then as priests, Men and women, priests of God, and we are described as, where did the high priest do his work? In the temple. So we're described as the temple of God. And the temple of the Holy Spirit, we have the high priest who is obviously working in the temple. And the body of Christ, we are his body, he is the head He's the head of the body. Not only giving direction, the head does more than just give direction. We're all parts of the body. One body, one head. Not many bodies, one head. Not one head, not not one body and many heads. But one head, one body. A spiritual body that makes up the believers of Jesus in submissive relationship to him. As members of the body, we, have very, we are various parts in the same way that I have a body that is made up of parts, of fingers and fingernails and feet and knees, and sometimes knees are replaced and things like that. So we have parts of our body, and Paul says there are comely parts and uncomely parts, that is, visible and invisible parts, parts that we display, parts that we cover and not display, stronger and weaker parts of the body. Uh, so it is, we have the body of Christ, and we have problems in the body of Christ, do we not? Sometimes, in the same way that we have problems in a physical body. And the blood of Jesus keeps the body clean in the same way that the, our blood cleans our system and provides for our system, so the blood of Christ provides. On and on we could go with the extended analogy of body that we're going to look at in greater detail. We're also referred to as not only body, but family. We are family, and it's not something that we just simply say and try to be. God made us that, and now we're living it out. Does every family have great relations, and every family gets along perfectly? I'm looking at a bunch to say that would not be true, right? Every family has what? Starts with a P, ends with a Roblins, right? Problems, every family does. And we... We all have problems as a fam- in our families. Don't expect any less in the family of God. We're going to have difficulties. Why? Because it's made up of people. People like you. You're the reason we have problems. just want you to know. But that's a good thing because, you see, you make up the body of Christ. You are the church. You don't go to church. You are church. And as church, you're part of the body. And there are weak parts of the body and there are stronger parts of the body and sometimes we need a little help with that. And so this comic kind of reveals that. Uh, I'm I'm particularly struck with this, if we can pull it up, because just recently I was challenged to uh, get hearing aids. Some of you haven't noticed, but I have hearing aids now and they help me out. And so maybe you like appreciate this. When one part, <laughs> let's leave it up there for a little while until everyone gets it. When one, 
When one of the part of the body suffers, all the body suffers, and sometimes we need a little help. And so it is we need clarification or strengthening the parts of the body, and so it is with this. Um, those of you who can't read way back in the back, back so soon, Mr. Smith, how was the hearing test? Um, okay. Thank you. <laughs> Some of you can explain that over lunch. So First Corinthians chapter... 12. <laughs> 1 Corinthians chapter 12. We're going to have a body lesson. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, 13, and 14 are the most clear passages of Scripture that describe the church as body. Now, and eventually, the picture of body breaks down because my finger is connected to the head, right? But how is my finger, my little finger, connected to the head? Through the hand, through the arm, through the chest, through the spinal column, to the head, right? Both nerves and muscles and sinews and all that connect the finger. But you see, you as a part of the body are directly connected to the head, But he places you as part of the body with relationship to each other, not in relationship to himself. That's where body breaks down. The picture of body does not describe our relationship with Christ through various parts of the body because you don't go directly through anyone except Jesus himself. You're part of his body. He is the head. Are you with me on that? So the picture communicates a specific set of teachings but not everything there is to know about the relationship we have with God through Christ. We are called the body of Christ. And so we, we talk about when the body gets together, which is kind of a funny picture because the body has been now separate and all over, parts of the body everywhere, and now the body is together. But that is a, an accurate picture in that here we are, the body of Christ. Pause just a moment, take a step back, take a good look at ourselves. Are we the only expression that make the body of Christ? No, because the body of Christ is universal. There is one church made up of individuals from all over the world who make the body of Christ. He is the one head over the one church. And so we are not the one church either locally or universally. We are the body, though, in the same way that we are the church, and yet we're not the church. Are you following me? Because we are not the only expression of church. Church is universal. Think of it this way. Is someone who's a Christian in the nation of China, someone who's a Christian... Is that individual a part of our church? Well, not part of the Boise Church of Christ proper. We are the church that meets here. But we are not the church total. So that individual who's a Christian who is in China, who presently is probably asleep for their 14 hours, depending on what part of China they're in, but they're about 14 hours different than us. So that person, though a part of the church, is not in an assembly with us and would not be recognized as a part of the Boise Church of Christ. Okay, so in in that respect, we are the church, but we're not the church. We are the body, but we're not the body. When the body of Christ meets together, this particular body, what does God want to happen with us? What does body do? What does body do? Well, body functions. Body supplies. Body acts. And so 1 Corinthians chapter 12, 13, and 14, I'm not going to ask you to read through, but that passage is talking about various parts of the body, specifically addressing gifts of the Holy Spirit that I believe that are gifted to the church today in different expressions than what we see in the first century. Still giftings, just different kinds of expressions that the Holy Spirit is presently doing today. 
You may argue with me about that if you want, and that's okay. I'd encourage you to. Do your own study. Do your own thinking. Do your own even experience. You know, I could be dead wrong. I don't think I am, but I could be. By the way, you may be as well. But uh, in fact, I would imagine if you disagree with me, just assume you are. Wrong. <laughs> so here's what I, I want you to get out of the passages, 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and 14, is not just the passage, not just the how did the gifts operate in the first century that we can learn how our gifts operate today and how we should be functioning in the assembly in a decent and orderly way. I want you to get the overall principle of 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and 14. The overall principle is this. Body builds up body. Body helps body. Body members are concerned about each other. So we have this communication. If one part of the body suffers, the whole body suffers. If one part of the body is rejoicing, the whole body rejoices with. We have this expression that we meet together for fellowship and instruction and encouragement. Instruction, fellowship, encouragement, and building each other up. Those are the four functions that are mentioned in 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and 14. I'm going to tell you that. Now, what I want you to do is study it. See if I'm right. Go back and strip back the terms of the gifts of the Spirit and see what the function of the gifts of the Spirit. And if you agree with me that we don't presently have the same expressions of those gifts of the, experience in our, of, of the Spirit in our assemblies the speaking in tongues, the prophesying, the healings, the whatever the expressions are there, that the Spirit of God is working differently today and may very well choose to work differently today as in doing what He did then. I would never say that the Spirit of God would not be able to permit or give someone the gift of speaking in tongues or prophecy or healings. or that That's His business, not mine. But it seems like today that the Spirit of God is working differently and gifting us differently. May I suggest to you that though the expressions of God may be different, the purpose, the purposes, the functions of the gifts are the same. Let me make this argument first. Did God always do and does He always do what He has always done? God split the Red Sea when he rescued the children of Israel out of Egypt. Does God do that every week? Has he done it since then? No, not the Red Sea. At least not that it was recorded anywhere. Did he do it again? Yeah, he did it in Jordan when they crossed over. The Jordan River separated like what was in the Red Sea as God brought them from the wilderness into the promised land. Those are the only two splittings of the water that I read about in the Bible. So because God acted that way then does not mean that God will act that way today. That's the principle upon which I'm building this, this message about the giftings. The gifts may be different, but the function, the purposes of them are the same. Why did God split the Red Sea? To rescue the people, to provide for His people. Why did God split the Jordan River? To bring the people from one position to another to give them what he had promised them. So his purposes for both of those were the same, though one was the sea and one was the river. Does God still bring people from one place to another? Does he still provide for his people? Does he do it in a different way? Okay, so the argument is presented. You don't have to accept it. This is my understanding of how God, if he worked in one way, that does not mean that he always works that way. And so it is that there are certain gifts of the first century that we don't see in operation today that doesn't mean that God's purposes and functions are not the same. For example, when the body gets together, what is our function? To instruct. Do we do that when we're together? Both from the front in classes and in sermon and in singing, do we instruct? Are you involved in a teaching process when you sing? No. 
How about when you interact with each other and you tell each other how the Lord has been working in your life this week? Does that instruct? How about if someone is seeking a little bit of wisdom and, and turns to you for prayer and for counsel? Is that instruct? How about build up? 1 Corinthians chapter 12, 13, 14 says the body meets together in order to build each other up. Do we build each other up today? Does God still want us to meet together to build each other up? The answer is obviously a resounding thank you. It just helps me understand that you're with me and you're awake. So if we're to build each other up, does God use you to build anyone up today here? Is there anyone here that you can look around and say, here's somebody I can encourage? That's another phrase that's used in 1 Corinthians 12, 13, 14. Encouraging one another. It's also used in Hebrews. As long as it's called today, encourage one another. Don't give up meeting together. All the more as you see the day approaching, the second coming apparently. Keep on meeting together. Not just in a big assembly, but meet together. And don't forsake that. Don't run away from those opportunities. Why? Because you need to encourage one another all the more as you see the day coming. As long as it's called today, encourage one another. Why? So that you don't develop an evil, unbelieving heart. God wants us to encourage one another. So the body meets together to be an encouragement. Look around. You see anybody in this room that needs a bit of encouragement? Well, let me open your eyes. How many of you here could stand a bit of encouragement this morning. Could I see your hands? Okay, now look around and see if there's anybody you might be able to encourage. There's enough of us here who need encouragement. God has us together. Do you think just maybe He might use you to encourage somebody today? If you have eyes open to use your gift to encourage someone. You say, I don't have anything to give. I don't have a gift. How about, I mean, I'm just going to make this as easy as I can. Some of you are using it already. The gift to smile. Now, how does a smile encourage? Really? How does a smile encourage someone? Doesn't it say to you, I acknowledge you, I affirm your existence, you're valuable to me? Does it express to you some joy that I'm experiencing? I, I doubt I'm somewhat happy at the present time. Doesn't a smile say that? I told you a couple weeks ago, you need to smile more often. It adds to your face value. <laughs> So even if it's something as simple as giving someone a smile, can you hug somebody today? Would that encourage someone? Touch, appropriate touch, but touch communicates love and connection in ways that nothing else does. There are basically three classes of people who need to be touched. Infants definitely need to be touched, cuddled, held, loved on. And they're easy to, aren't they? Yeah, they're they're easy to hold and and cuddle and communicate love in that way. And by the way, if we don't touch babies enough, they don't develop well. That's been fairly well established. I'll tell you another class of people that need to be touched, the, the older, especially the ones who have lost loved ones. So lonely. I some of you heard my grandmother when she was hardly able to move around she could get up on her own my mother said don't help her just put your hand on her back so I did and I would just have my hand on her back one day she she looked up at me she's standing up she said a warm hand on the back is so encouraging and I can visually see that I wish you could see the picture in my mind because that spoke to me tons of information We who are getting older, by the way, it's everyone in the room, we who are getting older really need touch. You can provide that in a wholesome, loving way. So I said there were three classes of people, the very, very young and the very, very old, and then everyone in between. We all need touched. It's a healthy thing. And so it is encouragement, building each other up, strengthening each other, instructing each other, encouraging one another. That's what the body of Christ is all about. And as we assemble, look for those opportunities. Because you see, that's God's purposes for us to be together. Now, what about when we're apart? 
Are we still the body of Christ? Yeah, we're still described the body of Christ. And so I want you to take this image of us being together as the body, encouraging, instructing, and building each other up. That's one application of today's lesson. The other application of today's lesson is this. You've walked with me before on this. I just want to remind you. When Jesus came to this world, what did he have to have in order to interact with other people? He needed to have a body. Jesus incarnated. God became flesh, and he lived among us, right? And so when Jesus lived among us, can we gain some insight as to how we're to act in the world by looking at how he acted in the world? Yeah, I think so. So what did he do when he was in his body? Well, there are several things that he did. I remember him praying often, late at night, early in the morning, all night long. He, he spent specific times in communication with God. When he was in the body, he prayed. What else did he do? He, he loved the unlovable. He touched the untouchable, literally. Literally. The ones who suffered leprosy were untouchables. And he not only healed the lepers from a distance, which we see him doing, with the word, which we see him doing, but we also see him touching the leper when he healed him. So he provided for him a double healing, not only a physical healing, but an emotional healing when he touched the untouchable. We see him... We see him healing the blind and the deaf. I'm going to physically heal the blind and the deaf. Perhaps God will do that. But I think there's some blind people who need the light of the gospel of Jesus. The body of Christ still provides light for the, for the blind and word for the deaf. The ones who have closed their ears to God and who have closed their eyes to God, having eyes they have not seen, having ears they have not heard. You and I are the hearing aids to the world. So I just want you to know, as we leave this room, as we leave this building, you as the body of Christ will be acting as the body because where is Jesus presently? Inside his body. Does Jesus still want to interact with people today? Does Jesus still sacrifice today? Not literally on the cross. Does Jesus still sacrifice today in us, in his body? We are. In that way, Paul says, I am crucified to the world and the world to me. We are continually sacrificing ourselves to the world and for the world and presenting our lives and our service and our words to the world to give them hope. You body of Christ. What part of the body are you? Jesus' body was literally nailed to the cross, buried in a tomb, raised from the dead, ascended into heaven, glorified and spiritualized. Whatever that means, that's what happened. Now he lives by his spirit in us, and we're now called the body of Christ, the temple of the Holy Spirit. That's who you are. So live that way. Jesus started his ministry by surrendering in baptism. John the Baptist baptized him, not for forgiveness, like we, but three things happened. The Spirit of God came down on him, he prayed, and God pronounced, this is my son. That's what happens to you when you're baptized. You're praying to him for forgiveness. The Spirit of God comes down to live, and he proclaims, my son, my daughter. And so we're going to begin our walk through the rest of this week as the body of Christ by proclaiming He is alive. He is alive. And we are the expression of Christ to this world, to each other when we're together, to the world when we're apart. You are the body of Christ. And so we're going to sing about Him being alive and us living and thriving in him, not just surviving, but thriving in him. And so would you stand and let's sing.